Okay, this is E Tornado No. 2, Spring 2014, Week 5, Lecture 1, Dr. Muthaswamy recording. This lecture is on timing closure. Now, before we get started, a uh, general note about timing closure. Uh, timing closure is both an art and, and a science. So, this lecture, you got to practice a lot and have a lot of experience to timing closer design. This lecture will just give you the big picture and we'll go through one example. Uh, but please understand that any practical design using FPGAs must be timing closed. If it's not timing closed, for example, let's take your senior design and you're using an FPGA. A classic example is uh, one of my best students, Colin Stapleton, he used an FPGA as his senior design project. Basically, his FPGA was 80% full and when he inserted another module, the entire design stopped working. Eventually, he got his senior design to work, but basically, for your 2 designs, propagation delay, because of the density of FPGA, etc., as we will cover shortly, uh, doesn't really matter. That is, your design doesn't have to be timing closed, but practical designs, if they're not timing closed, they will not function correctly. So, let's get into timing closure. First of all, there are the references, the main reference for this lecture is Altera online tutorials plus training modules. Okay, I highly recommend that in your let's say company you use FPGAs, then you ask them to send you to Altera training or whatever FPGA vendor they're using, their corresponding training for timing closure. Okay. And there is some information on there's actually an entire chapter on timing closure in map coming book. Uh, but that's very that's a little more advanced because we deal with uh, nonlinear dynamics so anyway if you're interested talk to me and i'll share the material with you but first of all why timing closure like i mentioned before 21st century has seen a huge increase in fpga density so it's let us to put some numbers into this uh fpga device logic density has increased approximately by 30x 30 times and the amount of embedded memory has increased by approximately 20 times ever since the dawn of the 21st century. And clock speeds of the design have also increased substantially. For example, memory interfaces, the DDR2 on the DE4 actually could run up to 600 megahertz. Therefore, modern FPGAs require complex timing constraints. You cannot manually check. It's impossible if timing parameters, and we'll talk about timing parameters later in the lecture, are satisfied for all registers. Even for your simple protocol interface, such as I squared C that you use to interface to your audio codec. So the audio codec is technically, speaking about the audio codec interface on your DE1 boards, it's a two-wire serial interface, okay, so which is analogous to I squared C. But getting back to timing closure, the good news is the FPG vendors have provided they provide sophisticated tools for timing closure. And whoops, the tool that we will use is the time course timing analyzer. But understand that. Uh, mm, uh, there are general ideas behind timing closure. So the main idea is the user specifies timing constraints such as clock frequency, setup times, hold times, etc. to the timing analysis tool via an SDC file. So SDC stands for Synopsis Design Constraints. Okay, And it's an industry standard, easy to use scripting language. It has been adopted by most FPGA vendors. So bottom line is we'll cover general ideas. Okay? So first of all, uh, what is timing closure? Uh, basically, every synchronous design has to run at a certain speed based on the design requirement. So we could, uh, there is no, I guess there is no specific definition of timing closure, but we could define timing closure as the optimal speed a design should run at. So some target parameters, in our case, the target parameters are going to be clock speed, setup times, hold times, recovery, and removal times are satisfied. So I think I forgot the words are satisfied, so let me write that in here. And I wrote up all these notes beforehand because if not, I won't be able to obviously finish this video in at most 23 minutes. Getting back, uh, practically, timing closure affects throughput, which is the average rate of valid output per clock cycle, and latency, which is the amount of slack time you have when, uh, or not the slack time, what am I saying? It's the amount of time required when the valid output is available after the input arrives. Okay. So it's usually measured in the number of clock cycles. So latency is also delay. Okay? And throughput and latency are kind of inversely proportional to each other. That is, 
if you want more throughput you want maximum um, pipelining that increases the latency if you want low latency that means more combinational logic therefore this reduces throughput okay but for us the we will use mainly these four uh, timing parameter definition so first is the classic setup and hold time so consider this D register so setup time is the amount of time before and it's a rising edge trigger D flip flop so setup time like it says it's setup time so it's the amount of time before the clock edge that the signal has to be stable for the D register to register uh, the input properly and hold time is the time after the clock edge that the input has to be stable and usually setup time is not equal to the hold time now set up slack and hold slack like it says or it's like an amount of slack that we have to satisfy setup time so it's the minimum times required minus the maximum data arrival time now time quest notation negative slack means timing requirements is not met therefore that is if your maximum data arrival time is greater than the minimum data required time for setup okay it means you have a setup slack violation hold slack is the minimum data arrival time minus the maximum data time required so it's the hold slack okay recovery and removal times which are the basically the third and fourth parameters these are dealing with asynchronous signals and this basically means the amount of time uh, before or after a clock edge the asynchronous signal must be deasserted okay and we won't be really covering these uh, two specs that much right because we don't deal with these synchronous logic but the most important point is probably that there are four steps involved in timing closure first of all we have to constrain all of our clocks that is we have to specify the maximum clock frequencies in our design and this is actually made pretty easy for us because we use face lock loops as you will shortly see it's made uh, the SDC corresponding SDC constraint command is very simple then we specify IO timing requirements and to specify IO timing and the example so to specify IO timing we basically look at data sheets of the appropriate devices that we interface to off chip that is off the FPGA on chip it depends on the design and in our case we'll do a simple 24 hour clock design so the off chip FPGA is actually asynchronous because we'll be simply writing to the seven segment displays via decoders okay and the fourth uh step is well the third step like i just mentioned is to constrain any synchronous paths and the fourth step is to t apply timing exceptions especially if you have multi-cycle uh if you have a multi-cycle design and we won't be covering timing ex exceptions accepts did i just write accepts so let's see apply timing exceptions okay and all of these are achieved via synopsis design constraints and there are some peculiar terminology I mean peculiar in the sense we are not covered it in this course yet associated with SDCs and uh, basically look up the on Altera online help on SDC but the ones we will be using our cell is a device building block a port for example what I mean by peculiar is as opposed to VHDL a port is a top level input and output pin okay well, I don't want to use the word pin because pin is an input or output of cells, right? So don't get confused between this port in the SDC terminology and the port associated with their VHDL. Do not confuse SDC with VHDL. They are different languages. But now for the rest of the 11 minutes, so approximately 11 minutes left in this lecture, let's look at an example. So I've posted this example online. Uh, it's under the 24-hour clock, right? So again, timing closure is an art and a science. So I won't be expecting you to do timing closure in 2902. However, I highly recommend you do work on understanding timing closure because you will need this, these ideas whenever you work on any practical design. And it's not, again, like any, like I keep saying, you should never really think about applications. You should be willing to learn new material and this just expands your knowledge of digital systems design. Yeah. All right. So getting into the 24 hour clock design. So let's look at the RTL viewer. Do I have to have it open? No, I don't. So to understand this. So as usual, 
I buffer the clock, the 50 megahertz board clock, using uh, PLL and total aside as the design, as the name implies, this basically implements a 24-hour clock on the DE1 board. Now, what I have done, the first difference is I've synchronized my reset. Okay, I'll show you a classic approach that is used in industry to make synchronous resets. That's point number one. But the most important point is I have a single global clock, right? So that is the 50 megahertz clock, right? So C0. So you can see I've highlighted the, let me zoom out. So highlighting this line again, you can see that I have a single, oops, try this again, there, single clock, right? How I move between the counter, the, how I enable the hours counter once the minutes counter overflows is by an enable pulse, right? So if you go inside this design, for example, here is my enable pulse generator. Okay, so if you go in here again, you should be able to recognize this from the single pulse generator FSM. Okay, so that's exactly where it is. And if you can have a single global clock for your design, that's what you should do. This is a fully synchronous design, and sometimes you may not be able to do this. Like, for example, when you have um, an interfacing to an external component, it's a classic example, right? But again, in this video, we'll simply cover the basics of time enclosure. Okay. So, the uh, and in order to have synchronous signals in the design for time enclosure, I basically have this reset synchronizer that is specified using block diagrams. And what it is, is I have this active low clear coming as my one of my inputs, and that actually goes into my clear and inputs of the D flip-flop, okay? So when... Uh, when I am out of reset, my D flip-flops are actually, they actually register VCC, okay? So in order to uh, implement this reset, okay, the synchronous reset, so to synchronize external reset, what I have is two signals coming in. One is my A clear N signal, which comes from my, uh, so, basically, what I'm trying to say is my external reset is asynchronous. That goes through my uh, flip-flop, okay? So again, this A clear N in, like I said, goes into my clear N input of my D flip-flop, okay? However, since I have an enable, I'm using enable pulses in order to reset uh, or in order to ensure that my design overflows properly once 24 hours have elapsed, that is all the counters get reset to zero, I have this internal reset signal coming in, okay, from my hours counter. So when this is one, my reset is becomes one and that resets all my um, counters properly, okay? So that's my synchronizer, number one. Number two, the seconds counter, let's just look at it, right? So the seconds counter is uh, basically a counter, and here is a single pulse generated state machine that basically says, well, it sends out a single pulse once the seconds generator overflows, which happens once the seconds counter overflow, which happens right here, we enable pulse generator. But now let's look at the synopsis design constraint file, SDC file. So step one is we add clock constraints, right? Since we have a global 50 megahertz or 20 nanoseconds clock, we assign the default name. I mean, we assign the 20 nanoseconds period to this clock named clock underscore 50. And this, I can actually specify any name, 
but in order to be consistent since our top level pin is also called clock underscore 50 uh, actually what am I saying uh, sorry it's getting late so this by the fact that this is, this is obviously called clock underscore 50 means the period of 20 nanoseconds is associated with this port there you go now in here we can specify virtual clocks if you are driving external devices right now we're not driving external devices and when we work on our project the i squared c the interface i will show you an sdc file where we do have virtual clocks right now the awesome thing is since we're using face lock loops we can use this altera enhanced stc command this is not available in um, there's an ultra specific STC command is what I'm trying to say. It's called drive PLL clocks, create base clocks. Uh, so basically the create base clock flag uh, generates the clocking constraints for all PLL input clocks, right? And since Altera knows what are the uncertainties such as setup times, hold times associated with their PLLs, we can use the drive clock uncertainty command to take care of satisfying setup times, hold times, etc. for the face lock loop, right? Now, I have, again, you should really go through all these comments. This hash mark obviously is a comment uh, syntax in STC akin to modelsim, right? But then let's get into IO constraints. Okay? So what do you do is we'll simply add output constraints to the hex display since these are, the, these are actually registered outputs. And in this case, the input and output delays don't really matter if you're driving. So I chose a maximum delay of 5 nanoseconds and a minimum delay of 10 nanoseconds okay. and the actual external key zero input although we are synchronizing it is truly asynchronous so this is the false path constraint I was talking about so we can remove it from uh, computing we can remove it from the timing constraint computations we have internally synchronized it we can use the false path constraints right again there is i'm 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 uh, i've uh, done a poor job explaining is dc because there is nothing to explain right just it's very obvious based on the comments what the sdc file is doing so please download the reference design and run it speaking about running it so let's get into tools time quest timing analysis and look at this is should be pretty useful that is in the context of understanding timing closure that's what i mean by use if timing closure if time quest ever starts up oh come on yeah here it is okay so let's read this so basically here is the timing I mean, it's all a bunch of different windows let's look at some of the very relevant reports right so let's look read the stc file first okay which you already created uh, it's taking forever okay so let's read the stc file let's look at setup summary okay and basically what we have is we have a slack of 0.953 uh, nanoseconds for our setup time for the clock, right? Uh, and you can make this so it's not in red. So the, the we have positive slack, that's good. And you can muck around with these max and min times, right? Uh, where is it? Here it is. So here. So you can muck around with these and see how it affects your so our setup slack. Let's look at hold slack. Okay, positive slack, recovery summary, right? Uh, removal summary. Then we can look at if max summary, the maximum frequency, all right? That's the maximum possible frequency we can run this design at, all right? So we can look at uh, report clocks, all right? So everything is good. Generated clocks, unconstrained paths, okay? We don't have any unconstrained paths. Uh, then let's see. There's a bunch of... Uh, uh, so let's look at if we have any failing paths. So there are no failing paths. And basically, I've already run the time quest timing analyzer and running on a time also. 
excuse the pun, and we can look at the report. So let's see, where's the summary at? And we can look at, so let's see, timing closure recommendations. Does not contain, so the worst case class is slack is 0.953 nanoseconds, is the shortest slack. That's what this is with the clock, if you remember. So basically, TimeQuest has used the slow model and given us some reports. Okay, worst case timing pads, uh, setup clock. So here, so hold. Then we can look at, let's see, the fast model, setup summary. Hold summary. So basically, in conclusion, design is fully constrained for timing requirements, it's for setup requirements. Oops. And then design is fully constrained for hold requirements. So we don't have any timing not closed error that you, well, the red warning that you usually see with your synchronous designs. So anyway, that's about it for this lecture. Again, timing closure is an art, all right? So you got to really practice this and understand uh, a lot about and go through a lot of sequential logic design so you and perform timing closure on it. So you become really good at this. And I highly recommend, although I don't make this compulsory in this class, that you do do so, all right? And uh, from time to time during lecture as well, I'll show you some SDC files and I'll also post them online on the Digital Systems website for your reference. All right, see you next lecture.